Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Bilal Abdul Karim and this is Face the Truth. We are with Shabnam Mayat from Protect the Rohingya and I'd like to say to you Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, Shabnam, you just came back from the uh, refugee camps. When did you come back and what, did, what news do you have from the Rakhine state? Okay, so I was in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh for a few days. I got back this morning. And um, I think the first thing that really strikes you when you get there, no matter how much you've read about it, is just the sheer scale of the situation. There are almost 700,000 refugees in 11 refugee camps, and um, 620,000 of those have come across in the past three months. And so just the scale, and because... Um, you know, Bangladesh has not given Rohingyas refugee status. They're calling them displaced Myanmar citizens. Um, they don't leave the camps, so they can't go outside and seek a livelihood. So literally everything needs to be provided, from meals to clothing, uh, to school, to medical facilities. And so the need is just so huge. So they're not giving them refugee status. Why is that the case? Well, I think that when you get refugee status, that means you certain rights um, you know, you get certain rights, and to you know, to stop, to sidestep having to give them those rights, um, that's that's what has happened. But also, the big issue is that Myanmar and Bangladesh are currently in a bilateral agreement for the repatriation of Rohingya, and this has been happening over the past two weeks. And they're supposed to name a joint committee who will work on this issue in the next two to three weeks' time. And this is, of course, hugely problematic for many reasons. Okay, but how is that, in all honesty, remotely realistic when they were just run out just a few weeks, for some of them a few days, uh, uh, over the last uh, two months or so? How is it possible? This is exactly what activists around the world are saying, that number one in international law, there is this principle of non-refoulement, which means that you cannot send refugees back to a place where they'll be persecuted. Number two, up until just two days ago, journalists who came back uh, to our hotel in Cox's Bazaar, who had been to the border, said that they saw smoke uh, rising, meaning something in Arakan is burning. And, and in the past three months, when something has been burning, it has been Rohingya villages. So, um, so definitely this is a huge issue. The other thing is that there are no specific terms. So the government is not saying that they will return the citizenship. They are not saying that Rohingya will have rights to work, that Rohingyas will have um, rights to own land, to um, attend schooling. Uh, the government is also not saying that Rohingya can return to their villages that they left from. Um, what they're saying is that they will be put into model villages. Um, you know, this could be anything in areas that where the Rohingya are not normally would in areas they are not actually familiar with. They're also saying um, that the land that has been burned previously, that's the 330 villages, are going back under government control, that the map of northern Rakhine is being redrawn. Um, you know, so, so all these issues basically lend to the fact, how will they return? Okay, I want to make sure that I am properly understanding this. The uh, Burmese government has not admitted to any wrongdoing which is the first thing, and not only, somehow... Sorry, yeah. not only have they not admitted to any wrongdoing, um, last month they took out their own investigation report. And this investigation report said that after almost 3,000 individuals were interviewed from 55 villages, that they found that no one had been... Uh, no, in, uh, no no innocent civilians had been raped or killed or assaulted. What had in fact happened in all of these three months is that 376 terrorists had been killed. So, so the government has totally, um, you know, denied any wrongdoing on its part. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And clearly, if it has done nothing wrong, then it doesn't see why it has to answer for anything or why it has to change its policies on the Rohingya. Okay. Uh now, uh, Pope Francis recently made a trip there, mm -hmm. and um, initially he refrained from using the word Rohingya, but then after that he did use it. Uh, first of all, what, was the, what impact could we expect from his visit? 
Right. Well, he didn't use the word in Myanmar. He did use the word in Bangladesh, where he met Rohingya refugees. Um, what we can expect is great awareness around the world, because obviously the Pope has millions of followers. Um, the problem, of course, is that people are going into Myanmar, um, and these are really high uh, you know, uh, well-known officials, rather, and, and they're saying one thing, or they, they're saying, okay, we don't want to close the doors with the government, we have to be careful how we speak, we have to be careful of the words we say. In fact, Myanmar, um, the priesthood in Myanmar had warned the Pope about this previously, and then obviously coming into Bangladesh, because there are um, you know, a million Rohingya in the country and because Bangladesh is housing so many of them and, and because the government has taken this positive stance on Rohingya, then it's easy to speak about them. What conclusions would you draw from the fact that uh, he would not mention the word Rohingya inside of Myanmar, but yet he mentioned it once he gets out? But in a global world that we're living in, in the age of uh, internet and satellite TV, there's no question that the uh, authorities in Myanmar saw him mention the word Rohingya. So uh, I'm, I'm confused here. What conclusions could we draw from that? Well, his, his reasoning was that he didn't want the doors to be shut as, as far as the dialogue was concerned and as far as him speaking about the issue. So he spoke broadly about refugees and rights of citizens, well, rights of all people and protection for all people. And so, so the reasoning has been uh, quite often from political figures that they just don't want the doors shut. And, and, they don't, and saying the word Rohingya would, of course, do that because we've seen in previous years just last year, you know, requests from the Myanmar government to officials not to use the word and many protests against the word being used. And so they're trying to sidestep or circumvent that by then speaking more generally in terms of um, ethnic minorities or those suffering humanitarian crisis. Okay, what is this, what's the state of the camps? I mean, we see some things on TV, but you were there, you saw, what did you see? It's the worst, really. I mean, firstly, the thing is that out of those more than half a million people, every single person who has left their home has a terrible story to tell and have witnessed loved ones being massacred, killed, raped, have been witnessing their villages burning down, have been forced to leave on foot, walking sometimes six days, seven days, eight days, carrying their young, carrying their elderly, you know, drinking from muddy streams along the way, sometimes eating grass or eating nothing at all to make their way across to Bangladesh. So firstly, people coming are coming with incredible trauma and they've seen terrible and brutal atrocities at the hands of the Myanmar um, military as well as as Rakhine Buddhist mobs. The second thing is, upon coming to the camp, because obviously they left with, you know, they just left their homes with the clothes they were wearing, they have nothing. So no money, no food, uh, definitely no papers. Um, you know, basically they need to start lives from scratch. So it's really a testament to the human spirit that they've even been able to get this far and they've been able to survive. But in the camps, the situation is incredibly dire because everything is needed. So something basic that we take for granted, like being able to go to the bathroom, you know, being able to go to the doctor, having meals available, none of that is a definite for them. Um when I met the Rohingya, it was in Banda Aceh in Indonesia. At that time, the camps were open. In other words, we found that it wasn't necessarily the authorities which were, t which were caring for these um, Rohingya, which were rescued from sea, but it was the local people. They were coming with rice, with food, clothing, and whatever they could provide for them. Is that the case there, or is everything uh, pretty much run by the government? Well, there are 11 camps in Bangladesh. The military is assisting in terms of administration and running up the camps. Um, but every single international organization is there, from the big organizations to the small ones. There's also aid from various governments. I mean, on a single day, you could probably see aid from at least three to six countries in any camp that you're working in. So, you know, um, organizations have projected that they will need around $434 million to look after the refugees. This week in articles, we're seeing that despite pledges, only 34% of that has been received. So there is really a huge need, and it's currently being met, you know, the Bangladeshi government, um, United Nations, various human rights organizations, NGOs, as well as various country governments, uh, Muslim countries mostly. $434 million, and that is for a period of? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's uh, around this year or, or the next few months, you know, going into next year. Okay. Um... 
you've worked on this uh, situation, this portfolio for some time. Um, you've seen the ups and the downs, and of course there are certainly more downs than there are ups. But from your perspective, where do you see this going, we'll say perhaps in the next six months? What do you think needs to take place? Well, I think international pressure is growing, and that's probably the first reason why Myanmar even started talking about this bilateral agreement, whatever it is. I mean, it, it's a disastrous agreement. It, it is a, Many are calling it a farce, but I think international pressure is forcing something to be said. The other thing is, yesterday at the United Nations, there was a special session, and the United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights, Zaydrad, um, basically said that he described the acts being suffered by the Rohingya as acts of appalling barbarity committed against the Rohingya, including deliberately burning people to death inside their homes, murders of children and adults, indiscriminate shooting of fleeing civilians, widespread rapes of women and girls, and the burning and destruction of houses, schools, markets, and mosques. And then he asked, can anyone rule out the elements of genocide which may be present? And this was when he was attending um, the 47 member state forum yesterday. So the fact that the United Nations is basically moved um, because they've called this ethnic cleansing and he's now adding the vocabulary of genocide shows that there's definitely a shift, but there can only be a shift for two reasons. Number one, that the situation on the ground is extremely dire. Pramila Pratan, who is um, in the UN, who deals specifically with um, victims of gender-based violence, said that she wanted to take the issue of rape being used as um, a weapon um, in this conflict to the ICC. And now, um, you know, such strong wording from the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights Rights. Obviously, this means that something is really being said, number one, or number two, as I said before, that the situation is that dire. And so these shifts, we have to remain positive about these shifts. Of course, the need for humanitarian aid is huge. And in the coming months, I think this is where we can all focus um, to lend a hand, but definitely to con continue with the pressure um, you know, by our various governments in the states where we live. Shemna Maid, I want to thank you for your time. I know you just got back, so I know you must be tired. But um, thank you very much for sharing some of this, uh, uh, you know, I would have to say very saddening news. It's unfortunate that we don't have uh, something more positive to look forward to. 700,000 refugees, 34% of the actual amounts that were pledged being collected. Uh, it's a difficult situation. But I want to thank you for coming on. Um, we're going to be looking for an update, inshallah, in the future. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Bilal Abdul Kareem and this is Face the Truth. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.